which will be of soft comfort, reassurance for believers. And from tonight, I'm going to speak this evening, God willing, on signs of the Savior's return. We're not looking for them. We're looking at them. They're everywhere. Education, medicine, politics, everywhere, all over the world, signs are He could be coming soon. Don't miss it tonight as we go into the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. And then, God willing, on Monday, the sea, uh, tomorrow night, I really warmly invite you to come. We're going to go into the old Hebrew prophet Ezekiel. And I want to draw your attention to a very great drama of the last days, the Magog War. It's coming. And it's an astonishing thing that we're living in these days of what I call resurgent Russia. Be on your TV this week. Russia, we thought was a finished, failed thing. But the Bible clearly indicates that in the last days to which we're moving, Russia will play a dramatic part in the great end time scenario. And we're headed for it. And my theme tomorrow night is Russia Islam. Who would ever dream that the world's number one atheist secular nation would join hands with the world's number one religious nation, Shiite Islam? That's what's going to happen, and that's beginning to happen right before our eyes, beyond your television in these nights. That's tomorrow night. Resurgent Russia, Islam, and the return of Christ. I do warmly invite you to join us night by night. I hope you can understand my lingo. I'm an Englishman, but I come from Devon, which is down in the West Country, very pretty county, uh, right down the bottom of England and out toward the West. And that's where I get my funny accent from. Some think I'm an Irishman, some think I'm an American. Some lady, one lady says, which part of Spain do you come from, Mr. Passo? She, her geography was pretty poor. Well, I want you to turn, friends, in your Bible, in the Word of God, and how lovely to turn to it this morning. I've a little passages to read from Luke 21, verse 34. Luke's Gospel 21 and verse 34. Thank you again for your loving welcome. It's a joy to be with you. The Lord Jesus issues here a warning, and take heed to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and is overeating and drunkenness. And we stop there and say, well, I'm a believer. I don't think I shall be, my heart will ever be overwhelmed. I don't need this warning. Surfeiting, uh, that is the God of, of, of eating and, uh, and drunkenness. Uh, I don't think I'll be tempted into that. But look what the Lord says next and the cares of this life. Earthly anxiety. That's what I want to share with you this morning. Turn forward in your Bibles, please, to, Luke's, to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And from verse 1, just a very few verses from this very familiar chapter. John 14, verse 1. These sublime words, perhaps the most sublime words ever penned in the English language, uh, translated, of course, from the Greek. But what blessed words these are. Let not your heart be troubled. Luke 21, he says, take heed, lest your heart be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. Oh yes, and the cares of this life. Don't you let your heart be swamped with anxiety. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, Believe also in me. He's not saying I'm not God. But as you believe in God, you believe in me. I also am divine. I am God. I am the Lord. I'm God. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. Isn't that wonderful? 
and where the, whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. But Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if you look down the chapter, please, to verse 27, if you're following in your Bible. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And then he repeats this beautiful command which he gives in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Brothers and sisters here this morning, I want to talk to you about cure, a remedy for a troubled heart. Maybe I'm speaking this morning. You're all strangers to me mostly. I don't know you, but maybe God who knows you knows that your heart is troubled. Maybe the business, maybe the family, the husband, the wife, the children, the grandchildren. We live in a world of worry, but I want to speak to you from Scripture about how you and I can live free from worry. How it's not God's will that we worry. How anxiety is not his purpose for us. But that as believers we are called to live a life ruled by the peace that Christ alone can give. How to live without worry or cure for a troubled heart. We seem to live in a world filled with anxiety. I read once about a young businessman in America. He was on the plane. They go to work on planes over there, don't they? And he was on the plane beside another businessman. They were dressed appropriately. And uh, he said he had a lot of trouble in his business. Oh, he, this other boy, he says, well, he said, uh, I don't worry. I used to have a lot of anxiety in my business. And they shared, uh, compared their, what they were doing in business. And as they were flying along, he says, you see, I don't have to worry about anything because I've just recently employed the worry firm. Oh, he says, that's a fun, I'd never heard of that. What's that? Well, he says, there's a firm, that there's a number now. But in my city where I live, we have a, a firm of professionals, and it's their task to worry for you. I don't have to worry. The worry firm does, how does that work? Well, he says, I email through on the, my machine the things I'd be worried about today, and I tell them that. I don't have to worry because... It's their worry. They, they, they worry for you. It's the, called the worry firm. Oh, he says, that sounds good. I've got a lot, lot of problems in my business. How much a week do they charge? Well, he says, about $3,000. How are you going to pay that? He says, that's their worry. <laughs> we seem to live in a world of anxiety, a world of concern. I don't think you'd argue with your speaker, your preacher this morning, if I were to submit to you that there's not much peace in our troubled world, not much peace in the world today, not much peace in the world of international concern. I read the other day there are at least a hundred wars being fought, thousands dying every day in the world. Many of them are tribal killings and wars. They're not even reported, but a world covered with many wars. We think of the 21 Coptic Christians, dear young men, I felt so grieved about them. I wrote to the Prime Minister and I wrote to different people about it. Beheaded on the coast of Libya. Recently, we thought, our politicians thought they've sorted Libya out, Gaddafi. The Arab Spring, what a fallacy, the whole thing. And ISIS killing 21 young men. You can get their photograph on the web. Each of them died with the name of Jesus on his lips. And after they beheaded them, they channeled their blood through the sand into the Mediterranean, dedicating their blood to the conquest of the people of the cross. I'm quoting what ISIS said. They think Europe's the people of the cross. And from North Africa, the blood of those young martyrs were poured into the Mediterranean Sea, dedicated to the conquest, the Islamic conquest, of the people of the cross. Not much peace on the international scene. Not much peace on the streets of our nation, 
murder, mayhem. We think too of the horror of mass abortion. We think of the violence going on. Not much peace in homes. Dysfunctional families, broken homes. I was the product of one of them. Domestic violence, child abuse. All of this going on in the world of the 21st century. We have never been so smart, never been so clever. Technology, science has moved the human race on. You'd have thought that the world would be a wonderful place. How smart we've become. Just to think for a moment, we can send American astronauts to the moon. They walked around up there and they left a copy of the scriptures up there. A little microfilm Bible. Who's going to read it? I don't know. A man on the moon, I suppose. But thank God they left the word of God up there. Christian astronaut. At least one of them was a Christian. Buzz Aldrin. Think of the technology and the science that got human beings to the moon and walk on it and then come back again. We're conquering outer space. But we can't conquer inner space. We've not found a remedy for the need of the human heart. And after all, we know that the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Men and women resolve to live secular lives. Some of them not outwardly wicked or violent, but they just live without God. That's it. That's it. Live without God. Fill your life with things, but God's not in it. Marrying and giving in marriage. Eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. What's wrong with that? Well, not much. But if you leave God out... That's it. That's the great blunder. For a man, a woman to live and die without faith in a personal Jesus Christ. The biggest blunder they'll ever make. We could have made it. Thank God for the day when the light of the gospel shone in. I was only 14 when I heard that glorious message of a God who loved me. He sent his son to die for me. And the preacher said, if you will give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, he'll give eternal life to you. Nobody had to beg me to go to the front. I was one of the first. I was one of the first. I was down there. I wanted that life that Christ died to give me. And that day, I invited Jesus Christ to come in. <laughs> and he did. And he's been in me ever since. The wonder of being saved. That's a miracle to get saved. But there's an even greater miracle to be kept. He's mighty to save and he's mighty to keep. So we live in a world of trouble. Modern man with all his sophistication and his science and his technology. We still live in a world of universal fear. I'm going to say this morning you don't have to agree with your preacher here. I don't think that for God's children, and I trust we're all Children of the Lord this morning, coming to church won't make you a Christian. Christians don't actually go to church. We are the church, the real believers, the ones that belong to Christ and are redeemed by the blood of Christ. I want to make a, a, a submission here. You don't have to agree with. I don't believe it was God's purpose or will for any one of us to ever worry about anything for one moment. We do. I have to say to you right here that I've not yet graduated in the school of non-worry. I still worry about things. But worry is not God's purpose or will for us. I, I even worried about coming here this morning and what we, were, what we were going to do. But that's not God's purpose or God's will for us. God's will for us is that we know this marvelous peace of which Jesus speaks. And I want to share with you quickly a few scriptures that will show you, demonstrate for you, from God's Word, from that divine information given by the Holy Spirit, by divine inspiration, that God wills that we are anxious about nothing. There are legitimate concerns, but that's a different thing. We are born again to live a life of peace. And here the Lord Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You believe in God. Believe also in me. And then he says, peace I leave with you. And in the Greek Bible, the New Testament of the Greek, it's interesting. 
It's in the terms of a, of a will. He's bequeathing it, leaving thing. Peace, I leave with you. It's in the terms of his will. I am going, but I'm going to leave behind my peace. Christ's own peace for my life. Here is the secret of composure when the world is going crazy. Here is a way of life that will be contrasted with the world around me. Peace in a troubled world. But we have to let this peace rule in us. I'll come to it in a moment in Colossians 1.15. You see, we Christians, we stand, we believers, we stand in church and we sing, and I love the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Mm -hmm. What a privilege to carry everything. Hold on a minute. Everything. Everything. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Sure, I do. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything. Everything. Everything to God in prayer. We sing about it, but sadly we don't practice it. And yet the Lord says this morning, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Friends, I, as I studied this, the word worry, we're all, we're all familiar with it, worries. The word worry comes, I studied from a Latin word, which literally means to divide the mind. Seems that there's something unhealthy and not good for us to go about the chores and the tasks of life, employment and home and family and work, but our minds are unhealthily divided. Worry. And then the medical people tell us, modern medicine teaches us that many of our modern day ailments, uh, heart failure, hypertension, many of these things, they're physical ailments but they have their root not in the body at all, but in the, in the psyche. The word psyche and soul are the same from the, from the Greek. It's the same thing, psyche and soul. Psych psych psychologists would deny, many of them, not all of them, the existence of the soul. But they're the same in the terminology, psyche and soul. Many of our modern sicknesses are psychosomatic. They're physical illnesses, but they have their root in the psyche or in the soul. Brothers and sisters, worry never gave to a man the strength to cope with a crisis. All worry does to us is rob us of the strength we need to face that crisis. Worry is futile and useless. No purpose for it. Doesn't help the thing at all. And they who worry most miss the most of God's peace. It just robs us of the help and the strength we need. One little lady in my congregation in my first church, she says, Pastor, thank you for the message. I worry all day about, I'm worried all day. I worry about everything. If any morning I wake up and I'm not worried, I, that starts me worrying about what I should be worrying about. I can't stop the worry habit. Psychiatrists call it the snowball effect. You know the snowball, you get the thing together and it's not too big, but the further you push that snowball down the lawn, the bigger it gets. The longer you stay with it, the worse it, the bigger it becomes. Anxiety, the snowball effect. The longer you stick with it and worry about that thing, the bigger and the bigger and the bigger it gets. You know about this, I know about this. Don't run with the snowball. Learn what I'm going to teach you this morning. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, first of all, to Philippians chapter 4. Uh, lots of you will know these lovely Bible verses concerning what I'm speaking about. Philippians chapter 4, and we're at verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, please, and verse 6. Be careful. For nothing. The Lord Jesus said, I would have you without carefulness. In our dear old King James Bible, it means be anxious for nothing. But in everything, see what it says, everything, by prayer 
and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Brothers and sisters, that verse teaches me, don't worry about it. Pray about it. There's the answer. Oh, and surely it must be safe to trust God if I pray and tell the Lord about it. And then it says in verse 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. See that word keep there in the Greek New Testament is to fortress or garrison. Here is the peace of God, the Lord says, will be a great keeper. It will garrison. What will it keep in garrison? will keep your heart. Hey, that's the realm of my emotions. And it will keep your mind. That's the realm of my intellect, my thinking day by day. The peace of God is a great keeper for the heart and for the mind. What a wonderful, wonderful thought. Psalm 119. Here's, here's something that's, that's beautiful in the Word of God this morning. Psalm 119. The longest one there is. Because it's such a long one, it's at verse 165. Psalm 119 and verse 165. Great peace, here it is. Great peace have they which love thy law, that is, who trust in the book. God wrote for us the scriptures. Great peace of they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. It means that nothing will war and offend the peace that I have. Great peace, and nothing shall offend the heart of the believer who knows this peace. And sometimes uh, people say, well, does it mean that it, giving offense or taking offense? Well, that's not actually in this verse, I don't think. I may be wrong. But I would say for a Christian, it is wrong for us to give offense, yes. But equally wrong to take offense, yes. The peace of God will be there when people say wrong things or show wrong behavior toward me. Yes, great peace of they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Turn to Colossians chapter 3, a verse I've mentioned. Here's a very important one, Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, friends, in verse 15. Here's a great verse for us this morning. Colossians 3, verse 15. You see, some people say, Brother Alec, please call me Alec. You can call me whatever you like. Titles mean nothing to me. I'm just one of God's little servants running about, trying hard to serve the Lord and obey the Lord. You can call me Alec. I'm, don't call me too early in the morning, all right. Colossians 3, verse 15. And let people say, how can I get this peace? I know men and women in my church that have got this peace. I wish I had it. How can I have this unbroken peace of Christ, his fellowship in my heart? Look, let the peace of God rule in your heart. I'll repeat, let. The Lord Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Here is cure for a troubled heart. Let not your heart be troubled. Anything that comes into the heart and mind, the will and the intellect, my inner life, that's where it comes. That's the battlefield. Is inside, it's in the mind and in the heart, realm of the emotions and the intellect. That's where the battle will be. Let, let the peace of God rule. Anything that's alien to that peace, don't turn it over, turn it out. Don't turn it over, turn it out. Was it Luther who said, uh, thinking of temptation, you can't stop the birds flying over your head. But you don't need to let them build nests in your hair. That's good, isn't it? Luther. Well, here we are told, let the peace of God rule in your heart when anxiety comes. Turn it out. 
Turn it over to the Lord. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which you are called. We're called to this peace in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the peace of God rule. I think one translation says, let the peace of God umpire in your hearts. Let the peace of God arbitrate. Do I have peace about this course of action? Do I have peace about this friendship with someone? And let, if you've no peace about it, turn it out. And let the peace of God rule and umpire in there. And a little word for us in 1 Peter chapter 5, and I, I'll, I'll hurry. 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're at verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 7, please. You'll know this verse. Casting all your care, anxiety, worry, casting all your care upon him. And how beautiful the word of God then says, he careth for you. Because he cares for you, you and I may cast all our care and anxiety upon him. Luther again, he said, oh, that we knew more of this blessed casting. Oh, that we knew more of this blessed casting. What does it mean in the Greek New Testament? Well, it means to cast, it means to transfer or to heave that thing. Like we take off a coat and cast it in a corner on a settee or something and your wife tells you to hang it where it should be. I know. Casting. If I were to take this hymn book this morning and cast it upon one of you, I'm not going to do that. We, we, we uh, respect the Word of God and the hymn book. But if I were to cast it down, you throw it, heave, heave it onto the, 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 the girl who told the lovely story. If I were to do that, she would have it. Cast it upon her. If I've got it, I must have taken it back again because I've cast it upon someone else. The only way I'll have it now is I must have taken it back again. Now the Bible teaches me, and please, I'm not preaching down this morning. I, I've not graduated in the school of non-worry. If I still have that anxiety, I've given it to the Lord, but I've not really given it to Him. I've taken it back again. Because as I've got it, I've not cast it. That's what the word means. To transfer, to throw it upon Him. Cast your burden upon the Lord. Uh, he, uh, and He cares for you. How wonderful. To cast it is to transfer it over. There's a lovely old hymn. You'll know it here in Northern Ireland. Take your burdens to the Lord. Take your burden, sorry, sing you. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. You know that song? Beautiful. Do you find, though, that the easy bit is taking it to the Lord? Sometimes troubles drive us to our knees. We're driven there. Take your burden to the Lord. Oh, that's easy. The hard part is leaving it there. Leaving it with God. And it's always safe to trust the Lord. Cast. Give that thing to the Lord. Troubled days, troubled homes, troubled world, troubled lives. But thank God, it's always safe to trust the Lord. You believe in God, says Jesus. Believe also in me. There it is. Believe. Believe. I can either trust and believe or worry. I can't do the two at the same time. I've I, I got to choose. If I'm worrying, I'm not believing and trusting. If I'm believing and trusting in the loving providence of a God who loves me, I won't be worried about anything. I'm going to finish very quickly. My wife went to be with the Lord two years ago this month. Nothing is the same. But Christ is the same. And how wonderful it's been to, to prove him in these days. She used to take a lot of ladies' meetings, and um, she was a good preacher, my wife. Sometimes she'd give me a sermon about something. You know, we husbands, we need a sermon from time to time. I'm getting down to something here. 
my wife would give me a good sermon. About once a week or so, usually the sermon had a very good application to it at the end. And praise the Lord. Well, I miss it. I miss it now. She, used to, she was a great lover of the writings of that Dutch Christian, Corrie ten Boom, who hid Jews in her home when the Nazis took over Germany. She understood what many Christians don't, the debt we owe to the Jew. And so she hid them out of love for Israel, and the Jewish people hid them in her home. And she was put into the concentration camp, Raffensbrück, the day before her sister died, she watched her beaten by those godless women, the Gestapo. Men too, of course, but she watched her sister beaten, Bessie, the day before she died. My wife had many books about Corrie ten Boom. Corrie ten Boom, my wife used to love to quote. She had a lot of lovely quotes. Here's one. There isn't a hole so deep. That's the hole that you get into in life, sometimes trouble. There's not a hole so deep that God isn't deeper. That good? He'll find you. He'll bring you up. And then Corrie ten Boom, and my wife used to quote, um, don't wrestle, nestle. That's good advice in life. Don't wrestle, nestle. Keep close to the Lord. And Corrie ten Boom used to talk about Christians. We go up the road of life carrying big, heavy suitcases full of rocks. Heavy, hardly managed to carry them up the road of life. And then we say, dear God, I can't take any more of this. This is it, Lord, I can't go on any further. And we bring the suitcase to the cross. And we tell Jesus about it, as the song says. We tell the Lord about it. Oh, Lord, there's this and there's this, and I'm worried about the boy, worried about the daughter, worried about the, this and the business. And we unpack all the rocks. We take all the rocks out of the case, Corrie ten Boom says, said, and when we've done that, we feel so good, we put all the rocks back in the suitcase again and put the lid down and carry that up the road again. Jesus Christ cares for you. So what I say is what the Word of God says. Casting all your care upon Him. He's concerned for you. He knows all about you. And it's always safe to trust the Lord. Let not your heart be troubled and never let it be afraid. Believe. Believe. Peace I leave with you.